Uh, I, uh, messed, I messed up last week. Um, I confused myself. Uh, uh, th this last week's quiz was supposed to be for, th for this week's quiz. Uh, and, and so that gives us just this wonderful opportunity of just going over the same thing again. All right, so let's, uh, let's go over this quiz and then we'll get on to the study questions themselves. Identify the decade within which the Westminster Standards were written. All right, so yes, the 1640s. And I wanted to put this back in front of us uh, just, uh, again, to give you something of the framework. So you have the Act of Supremacy. Who's the king? Henry VIII. He wants to divorce uh, Catherine of Aragon. The church won't let him, so he declares himself the head. Uh, Parliament confirms that. He divorces Catherine. He marries Anne Boleyn. Um, Henry dies, Edward, his young son, comes to the throne, the church is Protestantizing, and uh, 42 articles are uh, the height of its Protestant uh, confession. Very Protestant, on the, uh, particularly with regard to the Lord's Supper, uh, justification by faith, uh, uh, and um, you know, other, other uh, crucial, uh, you know, the authority of Scripture, centrality of authority of Scripture over tradition and other sources. So it's a very Protestant document. Who wrote, uh, those? Who, who wrote those? Cranmer puts them together. I'm sure he had help. Um, Edward dies tragically young. Young Josiah, as they called him, he died. Mary comes to the throne, Bloody Mary, and the Protestants begin to burn. And so many of the most uh, famous of the leaders, Ridley, Latimer, Hooper, Cranmer himself, are burned at the stake. You can go to Oxford today and stand on the spot where um, uh, Ridley, Latimer, and Cranmer were burned to death. Um, Mary dies um, after a short reign. Elizabeth uh, begins her long reign in 1558. Uh, the 39 articles are approved in 1563. Just a slight uh, alteration of the 42 articles. Still very, very Protestant on the authority of Scripture, on the nature of the sacrament, uh, on predestination, justification by faith. Very Protestant. Uh, James I comes to the throne uh, 40, what, six years later. Um, James uh, hates Presbyterianism, even though he was raised by Presbyterians, uh, or tutored by pres uh, Presbyterians. Uh, so a struggle ensues, um, uh, or continues, I should say, under James uh, I. Charles I su succeeds his father uh, in 1625. In 1633, he appoints Archbishop Laud as the uh, or, or, or Laud as the Archbishop, and the persecution of, uh, of Puritans heats up. Um, 1637, the attempt to impose episcopacy on the prayer book on Scotland. The long and the short of it is the English Civil War breaks out. Uh, ten years of that, the Parliament is triumphant. The King is beheaded. Uh, Cromwell's Commonwealth is established. Uh, when he dies, the, the uh, Commonwealth um, uh, falls apart, in effect, and so Parliament votes to restore the Stuart monarchy, Charles II. Two years later, the Act of Uniformity in, 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 um, requires um, subscription to the prayer book, the 39 Articles, um, Episcopal Church Government, and so forth. 2,000 Puritan ministers approximately are ejected from their churches. Uh, it's a time of hot persecution of the Puritans in England and especially the Covenanters, the Scottish Presbyterians in Scotland. Uh, 1688, uh, James, II, James II came to succeed Charles II. He was openly Roman Catholic and his son he had a son who was also Roman Catholic. This um, alarmed Parliament, and uh, maneuvers were made to um, uh, remove James II. It's called the Glorious Revolution. William and Mary, you know those, their names from the college. Uh, William was a, d a Dutch monarch. Mary was the daughter of James II. Inv they're invited to come and, and to take the throne, and they do a largely bloodless revolution um, and um, tolerance, the act of tolerance uh, legalizes 
uh, Presbyterianism, Congregationalism, Baptists, other um, non-Anglican denominations. So there's an uh, act of tolerance uh, for all other forms of Protestantism, not for the Roman Catholics, though. So in 1755, then, uh, just those, um, you know, 67 years later, when a petition is, uh, is sent to the king from Savannah asking for land, a grant of land, for a dissenting meeting house, they are dissenting from um, the um, Act of Uniformity of 1662, which, and, and, and they are exercising their, uh, their status as a tolerated religion uh, within the English establishment. So they didn't, they didn't conform, they dissented. They were nonconformists. Now legal in 1688, and so a dissenting meeting house is sought for such of the king's subjects as live in the province of Georgia. And that meeting, that land was granted for the construction of the dissenting meeting house for those of his subjects uh, who were professors of the doctrines of the Church of Scotland, namely the Westminster Confession. I hope that's perfectly clear now. Yes. The original vote at the very beginning that split from the Roman Catholic Church and the Church of England, Parliament was filled with what? Frightened um, delegates who were like, wanted to keep their heads on their shoulders. The fear of the king? Absolutely. Um, not the most dangerous job in England at the time was to be uh, a ser um, was to serve in, in Henry VIII's uh, government. So uh, what is the name? Um, not Oliver Cromwell, but Thomas Cromwell is regarded by many as the most effective uh, m uh, minister of the, of the British monarchs who ever lived, and Henry chopped his head off. Okay, to be married to Henry or to be uh, one of his ministers, uh, meaning governmental civil ministers, was about was as dangerous a thing as you could do. I mean, it was absolute terror to serve Henry VIII. So he beheaded his wives and he beheaded his government <laughs> officials. All right, um, the denominations that have adopted the Westminster Confession, we saw that last week. They are the Presbyterians, the Baptists, and the Congregationalists. All three. So your Baptist friends who think that we're quirky because we're Calvinists uh, and believe in predestination, you just need to say, go read your London Confession of 1689. Your denomination itself was founded on this. But no creeds in the Bible. Yeah. Yes, and for your Methodist friends, your Methodism came right out of the Church of England and Article 17 is predestinarian. So John Wesley died a, member, a minister in good standing in the Methodist Church. Um, and uh, subscribe, supposedly, to Article 17 of the 39 Articles, which is very clear on predestination. Your Lutheran friends, um, uh, Luther's bondage of the wills is more Calvinistic than Calvin. All right, his, um, you know, his um, ecclesiastical descendants, uh, you know, drifted away from that, but that's true of Luther. He was an Augustinian monk, for heaven's sakes. And so this is Augustinian uh, reformed Calvinistic theology that we have in the confession. And the Baptists and the, you know, uh, the Baptist Congregationalists, the Presbyterians, all have adopted it. And then as far as predestination, justification by faith, the authority of Scripture, you also have the Anglicans and the Methodists and who else? I don't know. All right, number three, which creeds and confessions did the Westminster Divines draw upon as they composed the Confession and Catechism? So the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Chalcedonian Affirmations, the Belgic Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism, um, and we Second, Hel Second Helvetic came out of uh, Zurich under Bullinger. Our, um, besides the Confession and Catechisms, what other documents the Assembly produce? The directories for worship, worship, worship and church, church government, discipline, is that part of church government? Coordination, right. Directory for ordination of ministers. Okay, um, why, what might be called a local church or an entire denomination, a creature of the Westminster Confession of Faith, 
I think we batted that around quite a bit. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's officers, right? It's elders, it's deacons, it's members are, are all in effect. Um, you know, they, the officers are subscribing to it. It's determined the ministers and it's officers and, and by um, extension, it's members since the very beginning. Um, why ought we to be skeptical about somebody who claims no creed but Christ? Uh, what was sec- suggested last week, no creed but Christ is a creed. It's a sl- short creed. It's not a long creed. It's a little tiny creed, but it's a creed. I mean, it's a belief. It's a, sta- it's a theological statement. It's a statement of belief. We believe that the only creed that one should have is Christ, and then we don't define Christ to tell you what we mean by Christ, but we're saying there's no creed but um, and also saying it's practically impossible because as soon as you start talking um, and using any language beside exact quotes from Scripture, you have departed from Scripture and you are formulating doctrinal truths. You are formulating truth statements that are not found in the Bible per se, exactly, word for word. So you are elaborating, you are expanding. Uh, every sermon is a creed in that respect. I think that's the correct understanding of what goes on week after week from the lectern and from the pulpit. You are teaching. You are expanding upon what the Bible says, and that is what we are supposed to do. As we'll see when we look at the chapter on Scripture. You could say then that they actually believe in a creed that is much less thoughtful and precise. And, uh, yeah, exactly. More, um, not, not to mention self so yeah, what's what's better, the you know the impromptu statements of a sincere preacher or the well thought out, um, you know, thoroughly audited and approved statement of learned and godly uh, ministers from uh, from generations ago. Yeah. So yes, don't think that no creed but the Bible, no creed but Christ. Uh, those are not. Those, they're, n- they're, not e- they're not fair statements. They're not accurate statements. They're not, uh, they prove in the end not to be internally consistent statements. Okay, any other questions about what we looked at last week? All right, let's, uh, let's move on then. And on to this week, which is the, the chapter on Scripture. So I'm going to start out this session of this class by putting this in front of you on the overhead. This is this. Now, I don't have to do it this way. I can just put in front of you what is actually in your notes. But I'm I'm putting this because I think it does help, and this is the advantage of this little gray copy, is that it has extensive scripture proofs um, spelt out. All right, so underneath the, the, the paragraph uh, from the confession is this, uh, this statement, um, but rather the text of, the, of, of scripture. So for that reason, that's why I recommend that you use this. If you want to see the scripture proofs, then you need to have this or you need to get this from the Free Church of Scotland or from the Banner of Truth Trust that has uh, the Westminster Confession with the scripture proofs and the other documents like the Directory for Worship and the Directory for Church Government. Are you going to have those in the bookshop by any chance or just order them? I think you better order them on your own at this point. Somebody call out for us what page this is on in your copy. Uh, where's question? What page is question number one? All right, page thirty then. Question number one is: What can we know of God through what's called the light of nature? Um, explain how this is so. One one. What can we know about God? Goodness, wisdom, power. But it's not enough to right. So here it is. Although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God. Now, those are the three headings under which this is typically uh, discussed. What do we know about God by just living in God's world? We know that he is good. How do we know that? Because the world is beautiful and, good and full of good things. 
Um, how do we know that God is wise? Any, any, any being that could create the world with all of its incredible complexity, um, and yet the unity and harmony, uh, th this complexity, and yet it all fits together, it all works, um, has to be extraordinarily wise. If everything down, if we can go with our, our, our microscopes and look at the smallest details and go with our telescopes and go out as far as we can go, and we see, uh, we see order, we see, um, we see that, it th that it works, that it fits, um, that this complexity has a harmony and a unity to it. Well, that's incredible wisdom. And then power, of course, to speak the world into existence, to bring it into existence by any means whatsoever means this God must be, this, this source of everything must be incredibly powerful. Uh, so these are, um, this, these are biblical arguments. Uh, for example, take the middle passage there, Romans 1. What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived. It's not, it's not obscure. This is not difficult. This is not hard. This is not rocket science. Uh, the, the power and nature of God can be clearly perceived, clearly understood. His invisible attributes Ever since the creation of the world, in other words, through the creation, through the created order, by how? By, by the things that have been made. So that if you don't believe in God, you don't have any excuse because you have this testimony screaming at you 24-7. From the day that you're born to the day that you die, you have the creation screaming at you about the truth of God. So Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. In other words, they're not whispering uh, is, this is not something that's uh, thin, thinly veiled. Uh, this is not something hiding in a corner. It, this is a declaration. The sky proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out the speech of what? The glory of God. Night to night reveals knowledge. Even though there is no speech and there are no words, and his voice is not heard, nevertheless the voice of the created things, as it were, go out through all the earth, and the words to the end of the world and so forth. It should be clear, it should be clear to everyone that, there, that the world exists by the hand of God, that there is a God behind uh, everything that has been, uh, has been created. So uh, Acts 14 would be another, another passage, I forget offhand which verse it is, but uh, where the Apostle Paul says to pagans who are trying to offer a sacrifice to him, and is it uh, Barnabas at that point, um, he says to them, um, trying to keep them from doing that, God has not left himself without witness in that he did good, sending you uh, rain and fruitful seasons, filling your hearts with um, joy and gladness. Okay, He did not leave himself without witness. You should know better than this. You should know better than to, do, than the, than to offer a sacrifice to another human being. Um, but you don't, but you're culpable for your ignorance because God has left a witness. Uh, so, and classically, amongst the theologians, there's, um, it's, it's organized differently by different um, uh, theologians. This is uh, called Aquinas' Five Ways. Uh, I think it's B Bishop Butler's Proofs and so forth. Sometimes called Proofs for the Existence of God. Um, I think to call them proofs is, um, as Bavink suggests, that's, um, that's uh, an exaggeration. Uh, the, I, I, pr I prefer with uh, Herman Bavink, the Dutch theologian, to call them, uh, to call them witnesses. So what are they? Cosmological. What, what's, uh, what's the cosmological about? Yeah, yes, the cosmological honor answers the question, why is there something rather than nothing? So there is something here. So we can, we can trace causation back, right? We can keep going uh, back farther and farther and farther, and, and you get all the way back, and then you're back to Adam and Eve, and then you keep going back, and you go back, and you go back, and you go back. 
What, what, what is there that is back there? All right. There, there has to be a beginning somewhere. What is there? Is, is it, is it uh, the impersonal plus chance plus time? You know, is it matter? Is it, is it, is it power? Is it, um, is, is it the impersonal or is it the personal? What, what something? So in other words, eternity is built into the fabric of the universe. Something, because you can't have something coming from nothing, right? You can't have pure nothingness and then suddenly something just jumps into the scene. If the whole universe is pure nothingness, then, then nothing exists. We don't exist. Nothing could exist. So you go all the way back. This is the cosmological argument. It's the causation argument. There has to be something back there. And whatever it is, it has to be adequate to explain everything that's here. Got it? So, so when, I was, when I was growing up, I remember on the schoolyard at the Dominguez Elementary School in um, Long Beach, California, I remember uh, kids saying things like, why do you believe in God? And well, I just do. And uh, where did God come from? And I say, well, uh, I don't, you know, I don't know where He came from. They say, see, you don't know where God came from. So how can you say there is a God? Uh, and the answer to that should have been, well, something has to be back there. I mean, wh where, wh what's back there if it isn't God, right? Everybody, in other words, everybody faces the where did it come from question. If it is just power or it's just impersonal matter, if, you, if, if, it's, if it's there, there, there still is the question, where did it come from? So the cosmological argument is saying that causation can be traced all the way back to an original something. Now, what is it? Okay, we haven't answered that question, but we know that, that there is something that is eternally there, an uncaused cause. Okay, uh, teleological. Um, is there design? You know, you, th you, you have your first child, some of you have not, but when you do have your first child and you, you see those tiny little fingers and they're, they're all, you know, they work, tiny little toes and tiny little ears and uh, you, see, you see design. I, 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 you know, they say there's no atheist in the foxhole. I think there's no atheist in the, in the delivery room. I think it's so extraordinary. Andy, you just had a fresh glimpse of the newborn. And it, it's, it's amazing. Um, is there design? Do we see design? Everywhere we look, do we see design? Do we see order? Do we see harmony? Do we see unity amidst all of the complexity? Is there a telos? Uh, a t telos has to do with end, purpose. Is there a purpose, an end, a design, a meaning uh, to be found in the universe? And um, so I, I don't. I say these are not proofs, but I say this is a pretty powerful argument. How do you get some whatev whatever is back here? It, it sure seems that it must be intelligent. Sure must be. It sure seems that way because there seems to be so much harmony, unity, and design Im amidst all the complexity of things. So it, it would seem, on, on the basis, you know, on cosmological, there m there must be something. And that something has to be eternal. But with the teleological, you know, it must be intelligent. It must, wh whatever it is back there, it's got to have a super brain uh, to be able to, to create everything. So Psalm 94 asks the question, he who has the ear, can he not hear? Who, rather, excuse me, he who created the ear, can he not hear? He who created the eye, can he not see? Uh, are we to imagine whatever the original source of everything is was able to um, produce an eye and, 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 and itself, himself, have no ability to see? So the universe produced an eye, but the universe has no capacity to see or to hear or to perceive or to understand. Does, does that make sense? You know, there's some people are going to argue that way, but... You know, the, the appeal here is, is this is not a witness that whatever the eternal thing is, it's got to be intelligent, super intelligent, extraordinarily intelligent, because there's design everywhere observable in, in the universe. All right, then the, the anthropological is a, is a little more subtle, a little more complex. Human beings, you know, we have, um, we have moral motions. How does an impersonal, irrational universe uh, produce people with 
uh, I think it's Francis Schaeffer who used that phrase, moral motion. Where does morality come from in an impersonal universe, in, an, in, a, in a dead universe, a non, non-living universe? How does it produce living beings and then living beings who are rational and have the ability to think and then living beings who are moral and living beings who are religious? You know, r- humanity is incurably religious. Everywhere you go, there, there are these um, you know, religious aspirations. And um, so we've created religions from the very beginning. There have been, you know, the religions have often been corrupt and, 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 and in error, uh, but that's what we see. People are religious. Where do, where do these religious aspirations, where does this quest for God uh, come from? So the argument of the, of the uh, anthropological ar- uh, the, um, argument, the argument of the anthropological argument is, you know, if, if, if they're living beings, there's got to be a living source. If they are moral beings, there must be a moral source. If they're religious beings, there must be the object of the religious affections and impulses that we have. How else do we explain these uh, these impulses, these aspirations, the sense of things, the sense of the divine that is seen, that um, is built into into all of us? Um, all right, the ontological, Frankie, you'll explain that one if you would, please. Um, uh, many, many times I accuse Dr. Johnson of shortchanging us just because he couldn't understand. I don't understand the ontological. So this summer. With uh, Mark Beamer, who's working on his PhD in philosophy, I sat down with him for three days at day camp and said, I want you to explain this to me. Mark B. Miller is going to explain the ontological argument to you. And he did his best. You gave him an entire impossible task. I know he's capable of doing it, but so as for you to understand it. <laughs> I never said I was a medic, still. <laughs> I understand it, but, but it is. The difficulty in it is getting from conception must mean existence. That's where, and Mark said, yeah, that's the whole, that's the real hitch in this, that's the real obstacle. Right. So the, the, and all the, you know, a lot of, a lot of the smart people think this is the most compelling one. Right. The smart people, they do. They, they seem to think this is, so the, the, so my rough uh, expression of it is that God is that being greater than whom one cannot conceive. We are, we are able to conceive of him, therefore he must exist. So I, for me, I can't get past conception to actuality. I don't know how you bridge from... But um, like I say, smart, what, how, how about, yes, Ollie, somebody recently out of seminary. I mean, so one, one step in the chain is that it's greater to exist in reality than merely in the mind. So what you said there, God is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. That exists in my mind, but then it would be greater to exist also in reality and not just in the mind. So there's something, I can now think of something that actually exists that's not merely on my mind. So it can't just exist in my mind, it must also exist in reality. Yeah, yeah. I still can't bridge that gap, Ollie. I can't get there. That, that was helpful, Ollie, but it still doesn't get me there. I'm giving you an extra step in the chat. Yeah, do, do you get there? I, mean, I think it's a slippery argument, yeah. I, I remember Carl Truman talking about it and saying that he's not convinced. Oh, good. So, does it sound like, well, maybe he's just not smart enough. I think Carl's smart enough. Carl, yes. It sounds a lot like I think therefore I am. As far as explaining your own existence, because you can conceive of it, I can conceive of God, therefore he did. I mean, is that what that is? That's what it sounds like. Well, but, yeah. It, yeah, there's a. For there's a, uh, that reason, I don't like it. Right. A superficial sim- similarity. Yeah, next question. Maybe it's the two birds in the bush are greater than the bird I have in my hand. Yeah, you guys are trying, but it's just. Um, what does ontological mean? Uh, it has to do with being. Ontology is the study of being. Um, well, like what Ollie was talking about earlier, it's like I can conceive of it in my mind, but it's greater than I can fathom. Um, 
So I, I just kind of thought it was funny, like the two birds in the bush. Like a bird, a bird in the hand is, is better than two in the bush. Yes. It's like the one I have is lesser than what is truly yes. there. But I do have something. You know what, if that helps you, more power to you. <laughs> All right, the, the last of these is the historical. Uh, the Apostle Paul expresses that, uh, do not be deceived, God is not mocked, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The law of sowing and reaping that look at in broad uh, epical dimensions, righteousness is rewarded and evil is punished. So that we see evidence of the government of God. Evil get their day, even in this world. Um, and history testifies to that reality, and scripture does echo that, like I say, with the, the law of sowing and reaping. You will get, you will get what you deserve. The justice will be seen even in this world. It's sometimes long delayed, but in the end, Sodom and Gomorrah are treated to, to fire and brimstone. Yes, Matthew? I think Bobbing says with the historical that there is no culture or time or people that have not had a God concept. So history proves to us, and it may be put the two together, uh, three and five, but history shows that people have believed in God. Where did that belief come from? Yeah, and I, I wonder too, um, even where, in, you know, in more modern times, we have a lot of people who say they don't believe in God. But it's amazing, those same people say extraordinary religious devotion to their causes. Religious-like devotion to their cause, fanaticism. You know, I think some, for some people, you know, climate change, for example, because virtually a religion. I mean, they're just absolutely devoted to the cause. Uh, or, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, they're just, they, 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 they don't believe in God, but something comes into that vacuum and replaces it. And so they become, um, you know, punishing, they, they punish the heretics. So you have a cancel culture, right? So if, you, if you're a heretic and you don't go along with the program, you know, you're silenced and you're punished and you may get fired. And, and, and so there is a kind of religious quality to the fanaticism of a secularist who doesn't believe in God. What, a comment somewhere? I said that's secular excommunication. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah, so you, get, uh, you get canceled, you get silenced, you get excommunicated. That, that's a religiosity. That's uh, the kind of, uh, of um, commitment that um, gets scorned when it's connected to the re New England Puritans, you know, who are putting people in stocks and whipping them and, uh, y you know, the, the, the witch trials and so forth and so on. But, you know, there is a secular counterpart to that. Or, or look at the fanaticism of uh, Lenin and then Stalin's regime in the Soviet Union. I mean, the people, people who didn't fit the category of working class, you know, if you were an aristocrat, you know, you're, you're shot. If you were upper middle class, you're shot. If you're a rich farmer, a kulak, you're sh you know, they, they uh, killed them by the mil tens of millions of people, uh, all in the pursuit of this fanatical utopian workers paradise. Anybody that got in the way and needed to be eliminated because they're preventing the perfect world from, from being realized. Uh, so, yeah, I think, I think that there is, a, there is a kind of an atheism, but it's uh, interesting that those who are such tend to have a kind of, fun, well, even the new atheists and the energy that they put into trying to persuade everyone else to be atheists. Uh, Do Dawkins and who are some of the others? Kitchen, yeah. So where do you put census to Ben Thomas? Is that anthropological or is that ontological? Um, I'm not sure about how to, how to use those categories. I just think it's built in. The, the sense of the divine is built into us. This idea, though, that I know that the, even the scientist of atheist knows that God exists. Yes. I think it's within. Um, but it's not, and not unrelated to what I see out there. You know, there's the sense of the divine that gives me the lens through which I'm seeing things, but I'm burying and suppressing it all the while uh, because um, I don't, I don't want to deal with the fact that there is a God to whom I'm accountable and with whom I will have to deal one day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Charlotte pushes pretty hard on historical <coughs> uh, making what I thought was some really interesting points. So a stand, starting with every culture and every era has had God. Now how do we account for that? And he goes through, well, from tradition. Well, where did the tradition come from? And pretty well goes through every possible other explanation and shoots them down. Yeah, well, if the tradition 
Administration was just mandated. Why didn't it go the next step and declare man to be God? But it doesn't do that. So I, I thought it was fascinating. So that's, that's, you know, C.S. Lewis, uh, you know, argues the forms of that. You know Lewis better than I do, but, you know, the, the universality of moral consciousness, the universality of religious consciousness, where does that come from? In, in, in a blind, dead, impersonal, amoral uh, universe, where does that come from? If it's not something built within, if it's not a God-given thing that where we have categories of the divine and of the, of, 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 of morality, right and wrong. So I, di I did never um, go back to Romans 2. The Gentiles, I cited this uh, two weeks ago on Sunday morning, do not have the law by nature built in. See, by nature, they do what the law requires. They are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. Okay, they've never seen the Ten Commandments. They don't know the law of Moses. They're ignorant of the Bible. They show that the work of law is written on their hearts. It's built in. You know, to put, you know, the easiest of all, you know you shouldn't just kill another human being. That's built in. You know that marriage is sacred. You know that uh, the pro property that belongs to somebody else doesn't belong to you, and you can't just take it from them. You know you shouldn't lie about people. Um, so these, uh, their conscience also bears witness their conflicting thoughts accusing or, ex or, excuse, or excusing them. So this is all... Um, Built in. So, although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and the power of God as to leave men inexcusable, okay, that's Rosa, Romans 1, so that they are without excuse, that they are not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and of His will which is necessary unto salvation. So, that brings us to question number two Why is scriptural revelation necessary? The will of God. Yeah, that it, so we need so we can distinguish between natural revelation and special revelation. The the knowledge of the way of salvation is not given in nature. Uh, there there might be a there, there there is a broad understanding that there is a God and um, um, I owe I owe to Him obedience and service, um, but I don't know how to get saved. So, therefore, it says, it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in diverse manners to reveal himself and declare that his will unto his church and afterwards for the better preserving and propagating of the truth and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruptions of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world to commit the same holy unto writing which make it the holy scripture to be most necessary. Those former ways of God revealing his will unto his people being now ceased. So, question number two, what was it? Um, why is scriptural revelation necessary? Uh, so, the inadequacy of natural revelation, as Ben just said. Um, how about for the better preserving and propagating of the truth? So that we have a reliable... Um, you know, committing, committing re uh, God's revelation to, to, to writing so that we have... Um, a, a reliable account of that revelation um, 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 preserved from corruption. You know, as it's passed, oral tradition passed on from gener generation to generation. I don't know if you've ever played that game where you sit in a circle and you whisper something and what comes out at the end, how, uh, what's that called? Telephone. Telephone. I never played that game. I just heard the people who do. Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, so that, that, that need to preserve the revelation that God has given so that it, it, it can be transmitted from generation to generation without corruption. That's what made scriptural revelation necessary. One, special revelation, we don't have, uh, we don't have the way of salvation. Two, uh, without scripture, we don't have a, a permanent um, account that is reliable of the revelation that God has given. Um, and then the third reason would be the cessation of special revelation. Um, those former ways of God revealing his will unto his people being now ceased. Ceased. Um, so a couple of, a couple of other uh, things. 
Yep. Uh, if you're quoting, can we just do a separate thing from you real quick? Or if you're quoting the WCF, yeah. how do you refer to it? Like if I actually go to John chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, if I go, if I, if I say 1, 1, that's uh, chapter 1, paragraph 1. 1, 2, parag as, as chapter 1, paragraph 2. So I'm putting in front of you now 21, 1. A kind, a kind of complementary, this is just for illustrative pur purposes. The light of nature showeth that there is a God who hath lordship and sovereignty over all, is good and does good unto all, and therefore, going back to again, what do we know through nature? We know that there is a God to be feared, loved, praised, called upon, trusted in, and served with all the heart, with all the soul, and with all the might. But, and then it goes on and says, I don't know how to worship him unless I'm given some special revelation. The acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself and so limited by his own revealed will that he may not be worshiped. And then it goes on uh, to, to address that. Um, okay, question number three. What would the confession make of modern day prophecy and extra scriptural revelations? Scripture is final. It's final, it's sufficient, and it's, it's, it's all we need for all the revelation that came after natural revelation. So anything else is beyond that. So that's the confessions, that's the confessions view. Uh, the former ways of God revealing his will unto his people being now ceased. So here's here's what I would say about that. I would say Whatever, let's say you're, you're coming out of a, a very strong, charismatic, Pentecostal uh, position that you believe in, in you know, ongoing revelation. I think even then you would distinguish, would you not, the revelation of God through the Old Testament prophets and through the apostles as recorded in Scripture from whatever is going on in your life and in your church. D d wouldn't, you, wouldn't you want to draw a line and say, okay, whatever that is, However I'm going to classify it, it's not the same as the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles. It doesn't have that authority. It, it, it's not that reliable. Um, we, we can't be as certain about it that it is from God as opposed to coming out of some person's, uh, somebody's imagination. Wouldn't we, wouldn't we want to say that? Even if we had the door open, say like Wayne Grudem does in his systematic theology, where he wants to have ongoing revelation. Well, I still want a word. I want a word to distinguish whatever that ongoing revelation is and it, that dis distinguishes it from the finality and the authority of what we have in the Bible. Is that a fair? Huh? If it's ongoing revelation, it cannot be less than what is in the Bible, which is the problem with that position. You're, you're, just, you're being a hard lighting, Dan. You're just... If, if God is continuing to speak today through special revelation, yeah. That speaking cannot be any less authoritative than what we have in Scripture. It probably would argue that it has localized re relevance, but he didn't want, uh, design it for the universal, you know, he didn't intend universal application of that revelation to the whole church for all time and all places. I've heard, I've to, to this point, Nebuchadnezzar's dream was about the statue, and you know, you had the... the the degrading of the, of the kingdoms. You had gold, silver, and bronze. There, it was it was an archetype of kingdom. It was it was a broader theme that a lot of human kingdoms fall into nowadays. Um, I guess if that helps. But it wasn't scripture. It, it was something that was very specific to him. But as you say, it was also broader, it was also archetypal, and it wasn't scripture. I mean, it just happened to all that today. I think the word that he's talking about distinguishing from special revelation is illumination. It's pointing to themes already laid out in the Bible that apply today, because the Bible is living and breathing and it is active today, and the things that are detailed in it manifest in the everyday life. Okay, okay so... So let me jump on that. That's exactly, I think, the two words that are important. I think you s reserve the word revelation for what we have in the Bible. 
that is universally applicable, that is authoritative universally, it, it stands there by itself. It has its own category. Um, and, and whatever is happening subsequent to that belongs um, classified separately. The way I believe we should look at these things is to see that as revelation. Everything else is, is a form of, of illumination. So it's fallible. Um, there, there certainly is insight. In other words, the whole, think of in terms of, the, and, and this is the language that the confession uses, as we'll see. So the Holy Spirit is giving me, is illuminating the meaning of Scripture and giving me insight into its meaning and its application and its relevance so that, I, so that I'm able to apply it to living, breathing situations today. So is, does that mean um, I can say, thus saith the Lord? You, you can say, thus saith the Lord, pretend this is Bible. Thus saith the Lord from here. Exactly. I can say but not from your church. Yeah. No. So from the pulpit, and when, I, when I do deviate from Scripture, I can't, I can't put the stamp of infallibility on anything that I say that is, you know, departs from Scripture. Um, thus saith the Lord, um, you single man, you're to marry so-and-so. Yes? If, uh, if we're going to consider, um, I guess, all the things that people say, like if they speak prophecies after, I guess, like the Bible ends, so assuming that somebody says now, the churches would consider that as extra biblical then? Because I've, I've heard people have prophecies, and I have a friend that show, like, shows me some people that seem to be saying things that end up being true. So what, what is the church's position on people like that? Like, Illumination, I at best. Uh, they might be false prophets. Uh, so, so as an example, um, I had a good friend in college who was that way all the time. You know, God was talking to him about what pair of socks to put on. I mean, literally, literally. Um, everything, God was talking to him and telling him. And, and, uh, and then God uh, told him to marry uh, so-and-so. And, and so it, w it was God told him, so he could not marry. And so he did, and six months later, they were divorced. So, so it, was, uh, it, it, was a, it was a mess. But I felt like that the devil was... Um, uh, was leading him down a path of destruction by confirming certain insights that he got about certain things. And he was right, and he was right, and he was right. And he began to think in terms of his own infallibility. This, uh, this revel these revelations that he was getting that were coming true, um, and, and then he got one that ruined his life. Um, so I just be, I, I'd be very careful about anybody who says, thus saith the Lord, because that to me is to go further than to understand whatever that dynamic is between the Holy Spirit and the words of Scripture. It's gone from illumination to revelation, which I think you don't drink the Kool-Aid when that happens. I think you run for the exits. Yes. There's a difference between like, the Spirit leading you to do something and God actually speaking physical words yeah. to you. Yeah, I think, again, leading goes under the classification of illumination. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I sometimes think that people say, well, the Lord told me to do thus and so. I think that they often are giving themselves the stamp of infallibility. I mean, the argument ends at that point. Why did you do that? Well, because God told me to. Oh, well, never mind. I mean, <laughs> what can I say to that? God told you to. Uh, it ends the conversation. Does anyone in this life, in this era, in this time, um, have, the, have, the, is it, have the right or is it wise for them to say, in response to any kind of challenge of a decision that's been made, God told me. So I'd be very hesitant. That's yes. why there's a difference, there, there's an element of humility in recognizing the difference between revelation and elimination. When we recognize elimination for what it really means, we are putting that to God's will instead of oh, I say this or I say that. We are praying that God will illumine us by his will to show us the direction that he wants us to go in his truth, not saying, oh, oh, I, you know, I say this and thus saith the Lord being revelation. We see that difference. So it's interesting in Ephesians and Colossians, Ephesians 5 says, um, be filled with the Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. 
and in Colossians, it's let the word of Christ dwell richly in you with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The one is the spirit, the one is the word. I, those are the things that, w that in the Reformed tradition we hold together. No spirit without word, no word without spirit. You need the spirit to interpret the word. You need the word in order to understand the guidance of the spirit. And when you, put a, you draw, drive a wedge between those two, you, you end up with a kind of a legalistic word or you end up with a kind of Holy Spirit fanaticism. You know, Luther said about Thomas Munster, one of the early Anabaptist leaders, that he swallowed the Holy Spirit feathers and all. He was a fanatic, and uh, it was his, his, uh, his leadership was a disaster uh, for his followers. Well, all right, let's that, take... That was the point that, that is a very pragmatic point. Has, has anybody ever been involved in a church or a movement or a situation where that kind of prophetic word from God was practiced and practiced and practiced and pushed that didn't end up in confusion, division, disaster. Yeah. It, it always does. Okay, write this one down. Acts 15, the Council of Jerusalem. James stands up. Uh, he's, he's got apostolic authority. What does he say in terms of the decision? It seemed right to us and to the Holy Spirit. He didn't say, thus saith the Lord. He doesn't say, God said, God told us this is what, no. Even as an apostle with the elders in Jerusalem, men living, he said, it seemed. You see, there's a tentativeness. There's a humility. You know, that we just don't know exactly what we should do. There's always an element of human frailty and human fallibility, and so... We, uh, we, we, we express our, our, our leading, our gu uh, guidance um, modestly. Ben? I think it connects well with what we get a little more into later with the whole counsel of God thing. The, the, the scripture doesn't always give us answers to every question, but it gives us wisdom. Yes, I would agree with that. Uh, Pat? Can I say one thing about illumination? I believe uh, illumination can only be had if you read the Bible. The Holy Spirit cannot illuminate anything inside of you if you haven't hidden the word of God in your heart. So I think, if, tell me if I'm wrong, if you've seen it, they don't read the Bible, so they don't discern it. They don't, so, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Does it make sense? Right, right, right. 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 So we're not reading the Bible, we're not men of the word, we're not encouraging people to be people so, of the So that's exactly what we're saying, word and spirit always together. Never, don't you se separate them, you're going, to, you're, you're going to jump the rails. All right, let's take a five minute break.